Hi, everyone, and welcome to the podcast on what has been a very busy and frenetic but very productive week. As promised, we have a very special guest that you all know well, the one and only S.G. Anand, who has graciously rebooked with us this week on what we had planned on last week before yet another monthly podcast of updates, geopolitical and financial. As always, if you're new to the channel, please do like, subscribe, and share, and hit that customization button so you don't miss a minute of the action. SG, good sir. Welcome back. How are you doing today? Doing well, John. It's always a pleasure, our discussions. Thank you for having me back. Oh, we look forward to it. Believe me, it's it's one of the many highlights that we, uh, we cherish here. So thanks again and uh, for being flexible with your schedule. Okay, so um, first question, SG, right off the bat. Uh, I was going to ask you about September 18th with the sentencing, but obviously, as you know, that's been pushed up to, I believe, November 20th of this year which frankly is kind of laughable because at that point, if we have an election, it's already been decided in his favor and it's really their way of conceding without admitting. Um, doesn't President Trump have immunity? And if so, what light can you shed in this situation in order to give people a sense of calm concerning the overall plan of action? You know, John, that's a heavy hitting question right out of the gate. So I'm going to preface by saying that, you know, I'm I'm relatively thoughtful, but I'm not a, a legal scholar, certainly not accredited. What I've seen in this process, though, as it pertains to President Trump is is the man is willing to go to extraordinary and otherworldly lengths to set precedent that needs to be set to keep corruption in check, both for now and for in perpetuity into the future. In other words, for our posterity, we have to have a framework. We need the literature, quite frankly, and the written word to guide a lot of the activities that are happening not only now, but the responses for those activities and the safeguards against them for the future. With respect to the sentencing, I find it very, very interesting that we've moved it all of the way out to the end of November. A great, a great many of us understand fundamentally what's going to happen on the 5th of November. So either we're seeing preparation for a non-cooperative, uh, in other words, a, a refusal from the other side to uh, relinquish power, and we could see a preparation for something you know, along those lines, or we're seeing this essentially staved off uh, into the infinitum, if you will, of cyberspace and memory, because with the ascent, a lawful ascent of President Trump to the presidency on the 5th of November, any sort of sentencing for things of that nature would go into deferment, as, at least conceivably, until the end of the president, uh, until the end of his presidency, excuse me, but potentially even into the future with the result of appellate investigations and things that may happen underneath the next executive. So with respect to the sentencing movement, I'll be totally honest out there. I'm not 100% certain what to make of it just yet, but what I can draw from it is this. It means we're going to move through the entirety of this period of time with certain conditions maintained as it pertains to the Mershon, uh, uh trial and, and sentencing. And one of those conditions, of course, was the gag order referencing the nepotism and the corruption uh, happening with inside the Southern District of New York Judiciary. We've seen President Trump talk a lot about the conflation between the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, and how a lot of these personnel are simply being recycled, some of them coming directly from the Biden White House or having associations, for example, with the Biden State Department. So, you know, in this period of time, I think the fact that we've got that gag maintained and that we've got this staved off all the way until the election, part of me is is uh, suspicious of what they're trying to prevent President Trump from being able to say and whether or not we see a peaceful transfer of power, uh, whether or not we see the Democrats basically say, well, we don't care about the results of the election. We're just going to to you know stay where we're at and uh, we dare you to come and take us out. I think any of that is possible going forward, but the fundamental truth that we have between now and then is that President Trump is not able, at least publicly, to say a lot of the things that we would sort of expect him to know, and that may work out in our favor. Silence often has lease. Uh, the audience out there that's familiar with concepts of warfare, they're going to understand terminologies like loose lips, sink ships. Uh, so in this period of time, we may be experiencing an irregular warfare maneuver that's being just staved off until an indefinite period of time after President Trump comes back. And we may be seeing the setup for a uh, potential removal of President Trump from the public for. And that may play out as well to our advantage with the fact that Q has told us, and I, and I take a lot of my inspiration from that online entity called Q, but Q has told us that President Trump cannot be 
publicly associated or even publicly opinionated on any of these types of events. As a matter of fact, he has to be as far away from them as possible, because if we were to see an actual you know, coup enacted against the government, if we were to see an actual dethroning, if you will, a forced dethroning of, a, of an American political power because that political power refused to respect the basic um, Republican process that we have here in the Union, we would not want any civilian, uh, you know, associate to include President Trump or anyone else to be caught up in the uh, the justifications for that. So it's a tall question you ask. I guess the the overall inadequate summary is that I don't really truly know. But as we look at the period of time, I'm looking at the irregular warfare advantages that we gain from this, and we gain several. We do. And no, you're absolutely right. And, and again, also SG, I also subscribe to a lot of, uh, of the overlay of what Q said about, you know, many comms and one of them is moves and counter moves. So I'm sure whatever agenda they've been set up, if it's not automatically the white hats or that orchestrated that delay, that they have a counter move already in place for it respectively. Um, pivoting forward SG, we know that Nassara has been rolling out over a period of time, period of years, the latest I'm aware of is 2019, looking to example, Chase uh, Bank in Canada uh, forgave a lot of debts for a lot of the Canadians over there, not all, but for many Canadians over there, as an example, back in 2019. And I know people who have personally benefited from it in a, a number of different iterations. And we see all of its many benefits that it, it entails. Unfortunately, the lion's share of the population has not seen it yet firsthand. With that in mind, can you kind of share when you expect the public to see uh, the overall the overall ancillary benefits of Nasara as a whole? You know, quite frankly, John, I'm expecting that to start either coinciding with the run up in the election, the two or three weeks prior to the election, or immediately after the events that will have to come after the election, once we adjudicate power back to we the people, whatever format that that particular avenue takes. Um, but we've heard President Trump talk a number of times about the biggest economic boom in American history. And so fundamentally, what that sounds like to me is a massive increase in wages relative to the cost of living and the cost of buying and selling. So when we look at that, that is a sort of a soft core introduction of the spirit, the esprit de Nassar, if we want to call it that. Uh, I also expect in the period of time going through this next administration, and and I would I would be remiss to say that I think it would be immediate because I don't think it would be immediate, but I think it would be towards the end of this next administrative cycle with Trump and his deep state obliteration team that we're going to start seeing a very serious and very loud discussion both domestically and internationally about reparations for COVID and what actually happened with the global health crisis and the worldwide declaration of war against we the people and freedom and sovereignty everywhere. We saw forced injections across multiple continents. We saw incredible lockstep behavior in the suppression of supply chains and the amplification of consolidation in that same period of time in a matter of months, not years, months, uh, to move levers that would normally take decades to move. So I think a lot of people out there uh, you know, fundamentally understand that getting over the first hurdle is, of course, getting the power back, getting the getting our hands back on the wheel. And that's what we've got going on with this election season, moving into this next Trump administration, you know, another populist victory, if we want to call it that, uh, out there amongst the, the former Commonwealth realms and the former global North world. But the second step beyond that is to be, begin having an intellectual conversation and a very serious conversation about what these overpowered institutions, bureaucracies, and foreign interests have been able to accomplish, not only within the domestic uh, you know, landscape of the United States, but also the domestic landscapes in all of the countries that are party to conventions like the Genocide Convention, for example, or the Conventions on Chemical and Biological Warfare. So looking at that, you know, you were the the fundamental basis of this question was what do we expect to see as far as the introduction of the basic uh, physical real world, see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it results of Nasara oriented policy. And I think that process is a slow burn process overall, but it will culminate in this repayment to the peoples of the world taken from the very globalist financial pulpits that that fleeced us for hundreds of years I think that repayment is going to come uh, towards the end of this next Trump administration, potentially even the beginning of the next presidential administration after that. 
And that that sort of caps off a four year period of explosive economic growth here in the United States that primes that pump. In other words, I'm expecting relief very, very soon, but I'm expecting the vibrance and the vitality and the thriving that comes as a result of that initial relief to continue for a period of years all the way towards 2030. Yeah, so I think you're probably right. Um, basically, what I'm hearing you say is basically around prior to the election, and then we'll have an overrun. Because you hear I'm talking about uh, basically a dead jubilee in, in parlance with respect to uh, Memorial Day of next year all the way into July of 2026. So he's kind of giving you comms right there to your point. Uh, speaking of the election, SG, there are many in divided camps on this particular issue. Uh, some feel there will be an election. Some don't think there will be. Uh, help us break the tie. Do you believe the October surprise could or most likely will be the Brunson case, which unfortunately some people think that that case is over? It's not. If you go on the Supreme Court docket and you look, it's actually very much in play. And we're actually going to have Lloyd Brunson on our show next month to articulate that, by the way. But do you believe that will the surprise of October will be the Brunson case, which, again, contrary to popular belief, is still alive? And to hear that that case will emerge victorious, does fraud truly vitiate everything? Well, U.S. code is ambiguous. Fraud vitiates everything, everything that occurred from the moment that the fraud was conceived and implemented to the point that the fraud was discovered and annulled. Uh, everything in that period is vitiated and removed. It's void. It didn't happen. And so we have to revert, literally revert back to the last lawful uh, arrangement that existed pre-fraud. And here's where this gets a little bit um, hairy, if we want to call it that. I think the October surprise could be a number of different things. And quite frankly, Lloyd Brunson is is top five or top six on my list for possible candidates for a fantastic October surprise. We know that the Supreme Court already has a calendared and scheduled session to release decisions and uh, to to discuss what they have decided based on oral arguments that have been presented in the past 12 months. So that is very clearly a very serious potential. The other component to this, though, is that we also have economy as a form of, um, you know, irregular warfare arena and area of operations. We also have the judiciary as a whole. You know, Lloyd Brunson's case is an excellent weapon against the corruption of the U.S. federal government, the U.S. judiciary, or excuse me, the U.S. legislative and executive uh, components, especially at the federal level. It talks about oaths of office. You could extrapolate that case precedent all of the way down the line. But the Brunson case doesn't fundamentally deal with the judiciary. One of the things that does, however, deal with the judiciary is the idea of this corporate republic, or excuse me, this corporation of government collapsing that has been protected by foreign registrants, unregistered foreign agents. So we've got Farah that comes into this as well, and I think that that's another potential October surprise because we've seen a significant amount of foreign association discussed in the narrative space surrounding the Bidens, surrounding even the Clintons in some regards. Uh, we saw Donald Trump Jr. share a meme just a few weeks ago, just a few weeks back uh, from the DNC where Governor Waltz, you know, during the time of the DNC meeting was meeting directly himself with Alexander Soros. So we've seen, you know, again, that foreign component highlighted as well. You know, EO 13848 was just extended yesterday, and it is, uh, it's is—it's an executive order titled Imposing Certain Sanctions in the Event of Foreign Interference in a United States Election. We've also seen President Trump talk about the uh, foreign attorneys and the foreign prosecutors backed by foreign groups, highlighting Soros very specifically, and other journalists taking it a little bit further, you know, beyond the things that he's able to say publicly. You know, so this is a man who's well aware that the judiciary, as well as our legislative and executive branches, has been, you know, virtually co-opted in a sense. So we could see, you know, an introduction of a case surrounding the national security of the United States with FARA as its spearhead. And we've got a number of cases that have been filed regarding foreign unregistered foreign agents, you know, going back three or four years now. I've seen everything from quo rentos to maritime cases and writs of mandamus that have been filed alleging that there's foreign interference, that there's foreign activity, and that the higher courts need to address the foreign, uh, the foreign-inspired prosecutions that are happening in the districts of the lower courts. 
So the question is actually a lot bigger than I think what a lot of people out there initially heard, which is what is the October surprise? The October surprise, I think, is is a, a sequence of events that propels us to a November to remember, quite frankly. You know, November 5th is an extremely symbolic date going back more than 400 years. When we talk about, you know, the original inspiration for Guy Fox, the original inspiration for the avatar that I have on my screen right now, right? That was a November 5th event that occurred where an, a, a We the People group very nearly was able to destroy the infiltrated parliament of the, of the English crown in a period of time where the crown was consolidating power due to political unrest and political turbulence. So the same, I think, is is very possible when we look at, you know, the sequence and the and maybe what I should say is the gravity of the same is very possible when we look at the sequence of events through October and into November. We've seen some sort of red October event every single October since President Trump took office in 2017. I don't think that's accidental in any form. Uh, additionally, President Trump has said three times in the last nine weeks that we're we're likely to see a 1929 style event if we see Kamala installed as president. And just on the 17th of August, The Hill ran an article titled Democrats might still invoke the 25th Amendment to make Kamala president. So, you know, eight plus 17, the eighth month, 17th day, that itself is 25. So there's a double edged communication right there in the irregular warfare landscape. If we were to see that, we clearly have the catalyst now for a significant economic event. What other October surprises may come as a result of an economic event kicking off that this administration cannot explain away or control? I think that's anybody's guess. And that doesn't even get back to the initial inspiration for your question, which is what happens with the Supreme Court's decision. If they come out and announce Brunson, for example, now we have precedent to hold every level of government across the entirety of the nation accountable to one thing and one thing only, which is their oath of office. And we know for a fact that a significant amount of all three of our branches of government across the territories of the 50 states of the union and at the federal level do not have lawful oaths of office on file or even worse, John, some of them have been revealed under FOIA to be to having been sworn to the International Monetary Fund. We know what lovely individuals they are. <laughs> Thankfully, they're being uh, stripped of their power here summarily here, despite what people might think or not yet see. Um, I had heard you say, speaking of, it's a good segue, actually, SG, so thanks for that. I had heard you say on another podcast recently that you believe that the global reset we're all waiting would have to come prior to the election in November. Um, do you still feel this way? And if so, why do you believe that specifically? You know, fundamentally, I think the currency reset process itself has been underway for quite a while. It's sort of like pushing the thousand ton cart down the railway line. It is moving, but it is moving slowly. You know, looking at this particular November timing, it's very interesting that we should have the Iraqi Central Bank releasing announcements just the other day, you know, highlighting progress yet again on negotiations pertaining to favored trade agreement status, revaluation of internal currency, and the Iraqi law enforcement uh, presence there inside the country has been just heavily, heavily involved targeting financial crimes specifically. They've actually requested regional assistance in a couple of cases for exactly that, uh, not the least of which came out of Kuwait, which was another country that we essentially bankrupted and stole all of their oil going back to H.W. Bush. It's kind of uh, poetic how things happen in twos and threes in this process. So looking then at the overall currency reset, I think what we absolutely have to have prior to the November election, or rather maybe a better way to say it is prior to the adjudication of President Trump having won the presidential election, whether that happens the 5th of November, the 24th of November, or the 1st of December. In that period of time, we must see the death of the serpent dollar. We must see the death of the central bank in its current form. President Trump has talked a number of times about doing away with the IRS, uh, repositioning personnel across the, the landscape of the federal government to do jobs geared at improving efficiency rather than fleecing the people. He's said several times that uh, he's thought about removing the income tax. These have been offhand comments, right? He's talked very openly about reducing uh, certain taxes in certain places and removing taxes in other places. And he's very loud about tariffs. And that's a that's a component of the conversation that I think we all need to remember because tariffs are fundamental 
properly balance interstate and international commerce with one another. If it's made inside our nation, it's cheaper if you buy it there. If it's made outside our nation, it's going to be a little bit more expensive than if it was in that other nation. There's nothing morally reprehensible about that. It allows nations to represent themselves at a fair and just level, especially those nations that have been essentially pil pilfered and pillaged for hundreds of years and have never had the opportunity to even share in the spoils of their own resources and wealth. So when President Trump talks about tariffs, he's talking about a Nasera landscape. We're talking about a, a post-financial reset situation, and he's making it sound like it's coming in his next administration. So if we extrapolate the timeframes from that, plus his um, his discussion about how an economic event needs to happen prior to the election so that he's not a, quote, another Herbert Hoover, uh, his statements regarding that 29-style event, and then we've got the marriage of that 25th Amendment out there in the sort of in the ethers waiting to come into play, I think that we can conclude any sort of revaluation that would have to come on the other side of such financial events would need to be basically ready to go in a in a relatively soon amount of time, or you would risk, you know, irrevocable chaos that would not be solvable and would not be recoverable moving into the future. And nobody wants that. So I think, you know, we can what we can trust in this process with respect to timing is that the little fish are being given their day at the at the table first. We're seeing that happen in Africa right now. We've been seeing that happen in South Asia and even in some of the island nations and, and in South America. Uh, the BRICS alliance has heavily expanded and has begun to reroute supply chain and trades uh, throughout the world, commerce markets and how they function, the literal kinetic infrastructure needed. So that's, you know, that's needed to divest away from that serpent dollar infrastructure. I think everything is, is pretty much ready to go. We're just waiting for those very large kickoff events between very large world powers that are going to, to reshape not just the finance component, but fundamentally, I think you'll see territorial exchange happen in the same, in the same time period almost concurrently. I'm sitting here laughing at you because you must be reading my notes because that's exactly where I was headed next. We're going to talk about BRICS in a moment, but I think as a prelude to that, that is one uh, country you're talking about with Africa, actually it's just a continent and one country within Africa that we should highlight that, that segues to your point nicely is Zimbabwe. And they hosted their elections, as you probably know, on August 23rd, yet it's con come and gone and gone incredibly dark as to the outcome of the election. Nelson Chamisa, as you know, is a Christian who is the people's choice like President Trump here in America. Um, we have just now started on our side to see him put out, I don't know if you saw, he put out on his X channel the other day, 20 campaign promises in the first 100 days of his administration. Boy, where does that sound familiar? And so I was just wondering if you had maybe could uh, ascertain details you could shed light to our audience about uh, when exactly? I know, you know, Elon has talked about how Starlink is now there. I believe they set that up in July, but now it's become optically available as of this month. So with all those things culminating, when do you imagine that the Zimbabwe results will come out and then Chamisa will be announced as the rightful president of Zimbabwe, much like here in America stateside, because, you know, the countries copy each other, where people can see some clarity within that respective nation? You know, with the events happening in the Middle East right now, the and the significant propensity for escalation uh, into a regional war that we're, we've all been expecting now for going over, I mean, really at this point, a month or more uh, from the from the Tehran pulpit, I think that we can expect, you know, clarification on events happening in Africa right around the same time that we see ramping up of those other conflicts. And let me explain. The African subcontinent has been essentially the functional arm of the U.S. national security state for a very long time. Various NGOs, globalist and domestic here in the United States, have virtually controlled every component part of African society from academia to healthcare, etc. The governmental pulpit is handled by the State Department, and the threat of the U.S. military is always the big bat in the background that no one can stand up to. So then looking at that, um, management of that kind of a complex, what is necessary for that? Corporate control is obviously necessary, and we we see that considering that Africa is one of the most pillaged continents in the planet, if it's not the most pillaged continent, uh, with respect to current supply chains worldwide. You also need cooperation from the diplomatic level. 
which means you need the ability of the intelligence community in the background to ensure that the proper diplomats, I'm using proper and air quotes, are in place at any given moment in time to maintain that post-colonial, but really just, you know, a colonial by any other form government that exists there on the ground. The African, you know, people know this. Uh, all of those respective communities, despite the fact that they have a, a history of being somewhat fragmented around certain tribal in interpretations, that's really no different than social interpretations here in the United States. And they all do recognize that there's a, or I say they all, but a significant amount of them do recognize that there is an unfair Western manipulation of their of their societies that's been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years at this point. And with the information age, I think there's a great deal of confidence that's brought to that same demographic. So this is a long answer, and I understand, but I really want the audience to follow where I'm coming with this answer. When we see geopolitical transitions of power happening, like what happened in Niger, where they evicted the French military, they took back control of their uranium reserves, which Niger has one of the largest uranium reserves. I think they're number three on the planet behind Kazakhstan and one of the other African nations. They have one of the largest reserves of that particular natural resource on Earth. The fact that they were able to do that is, is only accomplishable by the fact that they were disconnected in some form or meaningfully backwalled, if you will, or backstopped by another uh, very large power, which we know, of course, in this position to be Russia. Russia and Zimbabwe have been in very similar negotiations at a close level, but those negotiations have been a lot more quiet. You've seen Russian uh, troops on the ground through images that have come out, or excuse me, through pictures that have come out on uh, X and other platforms, but not a lot of news press given to that. And we've not seen any significant statements, save maybe one or two, from the Russian foreign ministry with what's going on in Zimbabwe politically for at least the last six months. This tells me, John, that there is some sort of vying for control that is happening in the background as it pertains to the 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 actual safety, if you will. Maybe this best is not the best way to say it. Integrity is maybe a better way to say it of the Zimbabwean government and the current uh, uh, financial and private public marriage that's happening inside that country. Zimbabwe has been a country that for a very long time has been fleeced of all of its resources, much like a lot of the other African nations, but they have had a very unique, uh, a uniquely active and well-adept and well-funded, uh, you know, well-fueled, if you want to call it that, currency exchange complex in the black market inside that country that has allowed for a, a single state, essentially, to function as a nexus for currency manipulation across the entirety of the African continent. So this is a major playground of the intelligence community. We know that Zimbabwe was a personal and favored playground of QE2 and the British monarchy and the British crown, which tells me that there's likely a, a deep uh, symbolic and esoteric component to what's happening there. So when we see radio silence coming out of an area like that, especially after a very significant election process, I think what we can conclude is that that struggle, which is likely between the secret services in the background of Russia, Zimbabwe, and the U.S., United States, you know, extension, uh, the Washington, D.C. extension there on the ground in Africa, in, including Nigeria, which just recently announced uh, adherence to some ridiculous energy policy that's going to, you know, profit the American corporations and fleece their people. You know, that's, an, that's a representation of that American uh, D.C. state that's not been fully de-entrenched from Africa. And so I think what you've got is a, a, a movement for control in the background of what's actually happening with power and, and functionality on the ground inside Zimbabwe. And so I'm bringing this back around now to the Middle East component. Why is it important to coincide this timing with the Middle East? Well, that's because of Turkey. Turkey is leaving NATO. Turkey is disempowering the ability of NATO to function militarily, not just safely in the Middle East, but the Turkish Air Force and the Turkish Army has an African continent reach. They went into Libya about 10 years ago, uh, post the Obama administration to help put you know, put to rest some of the terrorism activities and, and the financial fleecing activities that were occurring on the ground in Libya after we deposed Gaddafi. So when Turkey is pulled out of the NATO side publicly, placed on the side of Syria and Iran publicly, I think you're going to see a congealment of the Muslim world, and you're going to see a very serious disempowerment of NATO, which includes NATO's African extensions 
uh, for their ability to function both financially and kinetically on the ground. Now, remember, this is happening at the same time that Russia is likely to come to the aid of Damascus, and Russia is already on the ground in Africa in a lot of the surrounding nations to Zimbabwe, conducting basically what amounts to stabilization operations as we disconnect a lot of that you know, sub-Saharan African continent from Washington, D.C., so I guess all in all, to, to sum up this very long answer, we've got a number of geopolitical theaters that are going to converge, giving us a, an indication of the timing here. But I think what you've got right now with the radio silence is both sides awaiting uh, those larger geopolitical maneuvers in the background, because what happens in Zimbabwe is very significantly going to affect the health of the BRICS alliance. It's going to affect the health of the International Monetary Fund. It's going to affect the health of the World Bank, and it's going to upend worldwide precious metals markets, which is going to be a one-two kneecap punch to mm -hmm. all of the transnational banks in North American markets. Well, it's not, a, it's not a simplistic question, so I wouldn't have expected a very truncated answer. So I, I appreciate the, the articulation of detail. But if I understand you correctly, SG, before we go on, because I want to make sure I'm not mischaracterizing what you're saying, it seems as though, you know, you mentioned Nisera earlier and, and the timing of that. It would seem that based on your response that we could, we could anticipate or surmise a lot of sort of domino effect events kind of intersecting each other, would that be fair to say? It absolutely would. And you could very well contrive from this, you know, example, this hypothetical that we're having here, mm -hmm. an event coming out where a Zimbabwe populist candidate wins the election and begins hardcore efforts to revalue the country's currency and markets internally and to revalue the country's export markets externally. And that would immediately affect the silver markets, which affects the military control complex in the world. It would immediately affect the gold markets uh, and the titanium markets, which are going to affect not only military, but also financial components in the world. And if you were to see in response to that, some sort of significant destabilization attempted by the American backed, I should say Washington DC backed military machine in Africa to depose that populist candidate, I could very well see the Middle East regional theater exploding uh, in an effort to basically occupy that Washington, D.C. machine and prevent it from from uh, interfering in those sub-Saharan African interests any longer. It's a very thank you. It's a very understated point you just made, because a lot of people have concerns or questions or opining about when silver is going to make its move. We get that question on our, our channel all the time. So what you said really helps, I think, alleviate some of the concerns regarding that subject. So thanks again for adding that into the cachet of things. Speaking of the Middle East, and we'll tie it back to Iraq a little bit, because like you said, they're getting ready to get rid of their corrupt Iranian proxy central bank governor, Ali Alak, who's basically been an interim who just came stateside to DC, as you know, a couple weeks ago and formally said, hey, currency auctions end this year. We know that's critical because that allows the Ministry of Planning, where the private sector lies, where the real rate of the dinar lies, not on the Forex, to start coming of age. And they're about 95% of the way. We really just need to get that currency auction, as my audience knows, alleviated. And, and I think you would agree that we're, we're coming to that, that, uh, that tipping point. But with respect to the Middle East, we also have another situation, SG, as we've discussed in the past, brewing in the Persian Gulf, with the Strait of Hormuz potentially being blocked off. Additionally, you have U.S. warships that are being spotted in the area. Optically, it's made to look like World War III. Uh, then that should spike the price of oil dramatically. We've been, we've been seeing oil drop, I think, largely because of the, attributable to the fact that we're using so much oil reserves we shouldn't be using in the first place. But that's, you know, we know that situation. When do you see this occurring? When do you see oil prices really starting to make their, their move? And when do you think President Trump will opt to enact his peace deal that will kill this ex escalation full stop? Well, I can see the peace deal certainly coming in a transition period or perhaps the diplomatic framework being initially discussed, which would allay some concern, of course, to the escalation of these events. But I think we're going to see more of a, you know, a volcanic climax and then a spillover and then, you know, everything sort of dries up on the other side during that diplomatic period. I think we're going to see more of a a disempowerment, quite frankly, of petrodollar status and of its its liquidity and desirability 
prior to even getting to that point. And I think Trump has told us that a few times, right? The, the Herbert Hoover reference that he made earlier in the year is a good example of that. The, you know, I hate to, to wax redundant, but, or repetitive, excuse me, but the, the real component here really is the activities that happen between Israel, Syria, and Iran. You know, you have significant military powers in that region that are backed by significant geopolitical players around the world. Russia has the world's largest industrial base. China has one of the largest deposits of natural minerals and, and ores outside of oil in the world. Uh, China has been brokering militarized you know, arms agreements throughout the Middle East and Northern Africa as part of its Belt and Road Initiative, and Russia has certainly not stood in the way of that, uh, becoming much more closely aligned with Chinese trade and to the point that you know, Putin was recently in Mongolia. Um, and that's a whole other issue that would take you know, 10 or 12 minutes in itself to sort of dive into. So looking at the petrodollar, the Gulf of Aqaba, the Strait of Hormuz, the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, these are hugely significant areas, not just because of their symbolism, going back thousands of years with respect to commerce and supply chains worldwide, trade routes, etc., but also because of the components uh, that they represent with respect to data sharing capabilities, uh, submarine fiber optic cables that cut through the Red Sea into the Eastern Mediterranean, for example, carrying more than 80% of the telecom that's present in the Middle East. Uh, you've got the oil markets through the Gulf of Aqaba and the Strait of Hormuz, which you know really require no, no significant explanation to your audience. They're very intellectual and well-equipped for these issues. So it then becomes a sense, uh, a discussion of the common sensibility of it. How do we go through the process that we obviously need to go through and cause the least amount of worldwide devastation uh, commercially and financially possible? And I think the way we do that is we kill a number of the energy companies that are associated, smaller energy companies that are associated with larger U.S. Uh, either allies or or U.S. deep state direct correlations through corporate arrangements and agency cooperatives. And we take those out first, and I think that's what you've been seeing on the ground there with the slow escalation of a lot of this conflict, the assault on Syrian oil fields. Uh, for example, these oil fields are managed by corporations. They're not managed by directly by the United States. And that's one of the things that are missing in a lot of these news reports is – you know, we're, we're giving territorial control back to lawful arenas, but that control transition or that transfer of control isn't exactly clean because you've got a conflation of interests and a lot of personnel on the ground on both sides that think that they're standing in the best interest for what's going on on their respective side. And that's fundamentally, in many cases, that's just not the case, John, especially in the Middle East. We've got a significant amount of the secret society intelligence community that is managing the Middle East simply utilizing the 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 militarized arm of the US DOD as their mafia enforcer but they really don't have a whole lot of say they're just there to to protect and guide basically so coming back to your question about the petrodollar you know i think the most reasonable um avenue that we can see right now is some sort of escalation in the conflict between Israel and its neighbors uh, we've got Damascus in the crosshairs, I think, not just because of biblical prophecy, but also because the fact that Damascus plays host to the one regional power that really offers Israel a huge a thorn in its side because they can't do anything directly about Assad without ticking off Moscow. And Israel, I think, fundamentally, even even you know, for certain uh, for certain incredulous qualities, we'll just put it that way. I think Bibi Netanyahu fundamentally understands that there's no possible way his state could take on the Russian military or or anything, you know, sort of aligned with that. And obviously going into Syria in a significant way would immediately involve Tehran in a very large conflict, which fundamentally none of the Israeli people want. The Israeli intelligence community, however, seems, you know, hell bent on on any other scenario. But so you know, looking at this petrodollar, what I'm expecting is that Tehran, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Syria are all wrapped into or somehow co-opted into a larger regional conflict, likely uh, spawning off from activity carried out by the U.S. intelligence community and the, the Israeli-based Mossad intelligence community. And that's going to provide the justification for certain territories to turn off the flow of commerce. If Egypt chooses to close the Suez Canal, there's nothing the rest of the planet can do about that. Egypt has territorial control of their canal. The same is true of the Strait of Hormuz, which is shared 50-50 essentially by Iran and Saudi Arabia. So, And it's interesting that we should see Saudi Arabia coming out as almost like a Switzerland 
uh, in the Middle East at this particular you know point in time, where, whereas Turkey, which has been the de facto leader of the Sunni Muslim world for 600 years, is increasingly um, more resolute and aggressive in their rhetoric that Israel is acting as a terrorist state. And if they continue in this way, Turkey may have no choice but to be involved. Turkey could actually be the linchpin that sort of sucks Riyadh into this entire process. And once that happens, any diplomatic cooperative arrangements between U.S. and Saudi Arabian energy companies and energy markets are going to be heavily, heavily strained. And that doesn't even include the actual closures that may occur in these waterways, which I think you know, common sense and and logic and reason would dictate to us are the most likely outcomes of an expanded Middle East conflict. Exactly. And also to your point, just tying back to Iraq, Israel plays a pivotal role, as you know, per the prophetic word of Kim Clement to do what, what's going to perceive to be the grave mistake, but it's really a grave surrender of them hitting those power plants in Iran, which will then free up Iraq to do what they need to do and revalue, reinstate their currency as the grand opening linchpin to the other currencies that will roll out concurrently. Um, so yeah, very, very good points on that. Thank you. Um, now, I know, SG, you weren't around for this time, as you've mentioned before, optically, but you're also an ardent student of history, admittedly. And so I'm kind of banking on the fact that we're one of the few people to ask you this question, when that is the following, that I remember vividly back in 1992, when I was a kid, I was going to visit my dad and New York City during typical here in America summer school breaks, right? And he worked in the city for a paper company and I used to visit him every summer and spend time with him. And I remember being in the city, there was a channel called, many New Yorkers will know it, 1010 Wins. And their slogan was, give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world from their perspective, but nonetheless. Anyway, I remember them saying Donald Trump uh, at that time purposely bankrupted his companies uh, in order to reset them. And I didn't know anything to the degree I know now financially and the whole of the world's geopolitical intertwinings, right? That you and I widely discuss every time. But in my spirit, in my knowing, I knew that that was a very significant seminal moment in the world, that he, him doing that had value and significance for a reason I was not yet privy to. Now, here we are, 32 years later, he's now bankrupting the US corporation and resetting the country back to the constitutional republic. As you study history, if you have recalled that moment in looking, would you agree or feel in your own inclination that that was a significant demarcation moment that is now paying dividends for where we stand in the world's currency and the geopolitical front today? Oh, I think without question, when you look at Trump's pedigree and his background and the exposure that he's had to these very international markets and, and pulpits of financial power and control, you know, it's, it's beyond a doubt that this is an individual who is eminently qualified to manage this particular uh, period in time and who also would have understood from a constitutional sense how some of this was going to have to be done because you were dealing with national sovereignty and national security. You had to have a president. It had to be the president. It couldn't be anyone's, for example. And then you also had to have a president who understood how back, um, let me back that up, how espionage works, how the ability of sleight of hand control works, how control happened in the background, because that's what finance is, right? Money is a form of soft control, but it's extremely powerful. So when you look at you know, the bankrupting of something like the U.S. corporation, this is a hundred plus year entity. Uh, it really goes back quite a bit further than that when you look at the actual incorporation of D.C. itself first and then the, the incorporation later of the territories of the states of the Union. We're talking a, you know, a near 200-year uh, problem that we're you know, going through and handling. And I think President Trump was approached directly by, the, the, um, by retired generals of the United States military and requested to stand in and, and oversee this period of time, right? We know that beyond the assassination of President Kennedy, there was a group within the Pentagon, significant group of generals and commanders that came together and said, we need to put together essentially a plan to remove this Hydra from the from Washington, D.C. and from this nation, and also not really the nation world in the process, because they just got away with this and we weren't able to stop it. So coming forward into the period of time that we're in now, I think we're witnessing the culmination of a six decades plus plan. 
I think Trump was one of a number of individuals that was interviewed, quite frankly, by these retired members of the military and that he, you know, made the most sense and was the most willing, I think, to come to the table and do this. I think we saw this happen around about the time that Trump began getting very, very active on Twitter around 2012, 2013 with his hostile rhetoric towards the Obama administration. I think that was around the time frame that President Trump was actually contacted when he was still citizen Trump by individuals retired, potentially active, but certainly retired from the military of the United States and asked to oversee the bankruptcy. You know, this was a business agreement more than anything else, but it involved militarized forces. It also involved an extraordinary threat to the safety and security of humanity, sort of the 1159 mark, if we want to call it that, with the the intention of Hillary Clinton to not only run for president, but then plunge the world into a nuclear apocalypse. And so the timing, I think, worked out very nicely where, you know, patriotic forces that had been architecting a plan for a very long time to take back control of our judiciary and our finance we're also able to coincide that timing with the bankrupting of the corporation and the actual removal of the deep state and the disappointment of a long-term depopulation agenda that was aimed at killing about 7 billion people. Yeah, absolutely. And in this SG, you, you sort of illustrated the backbone as to why our channel is so heavily focused on the financial side, primarily because we believe wholly that a long time ago, and I say we are a team specifically, as you, as you may recall, uh, believes that those who control the finances effectuate the decisions of all of us, what we eat, where we live, how we govern ourselves, what we have access to, et cetera, et cetera, and, and controls our quality of life. And what we see now uh, from a Christian faith standpoint is we see the wealth of the wicked, as Proverbs says, being laid up for the righteous in a very literal way. Uh, speaking of the finances, we have an interest rate cut, as you know, SG, next Wednesday, the 18th, which is less than uh, about seven, eight days away now. And it seems that there are some other global reset events tied to that date. For example, the SEC case against the XRP is expected to make their render the decision to announce that they're not going to be appealing the decision, which we already know they're going to have to do at some point. Um, it doesn't mean it's a guarantee, but it's the high degree of probability that's the time frame. This should signal the spike for XRP and its connection to the blockchain for the QFS as well, and also connects, as you know, to the BRICS and eventually the precious metals market. Um, if anything, what can you share with us about the 18th and its monumental importance for the global economy? Well... You know, not a whole lot probably that you've not covered with your audience because you all are, again, very well adept at this arena of the discussion. But I think it's interesting that this was the initial date set for the Trump trial sentencing, right? The the 18th of September, 9, and then you have 8 plus 1 is 9, and then you have 8 on the end. So there's 17 two different directions if you want to do that gematria-wise. But fundamentally, the fact that we're expected to see the final acquiescence of XRP Ripple and, the, and that entire case against the SEC, that's significant for a number of reasons, John, but not the least of which is because it sets precedent that infrastructural financial association uh, or infrastructural financial creations, maybe is a better way to say that, are not going to be subject to the same Chevron doctrine style throttling that they have always been subject to before and which has prevented any uh, emergence of any kind or resurgence of old of you know potentially old modalities and mechanisms against the U.S. fiat dollar system and that you know debt for debt ridiculous model that would make Bernie Madoff you know look like a choir boy. So in the sense that we've now got the adjudication for that case and the September 18th date comes out and and we're expecting this to be the final you know, case closed day, if you will, on this particular discussion. Now we have the ongoing precedent set and, and essentially acquiescence from those regulatory industries, which you know very well affects how the markets behave in a very significant way and often in a rapid fashion. We have the official acquiescence of that regulatory complex to the supremacy of a decentralized infrastructural token. Now, decentralized is something that I think you can extrapolate across certainly the 50 states of the union here in the United States, but the model could go worldwide. Infrastructural allows us to you know, bring new creations to the fore that may accelerate transaction efficiency, may accelerate ledger reconciliation or augment that reconciliation functionality that XRP does so well. 
We certainly are going to see additional security infrastructure built out by incredible entrepreneurs. President Trump talked about some of those entrepreneurs at the Bitcoin conference just a number of weeks back and how they're going to be very pivotal for the economy of the future. There's a reason the man is saying this, right? We, we need to step back and appreciate the, the 80,000 foot umbrella that we're speaking to and with here. And so the 18th of September, I think that's setting us up again for you know yet another nail in that petrodollar coffin that we were talking about a moment ago. It brings a, a decent amount of stability to a decentralized, what I would call sub you know subculture markets that are operating inside of BRICS nations, but are not directly involved in the activities of commerce inside BRICS. It's one of the reasons that you see a deployment of law enforcement inside some of those nations because you still have counterculture commerce that's running in there. I think a decision like this fundamentally destabilizes the the black market component of those subculture markets and sort of amplifies or or assuages maybe is a better way to say it the the decent component of those counterculture markets that really just want to be valued correctly and they want decentralization at the fore right they want privacy they want security they want the ability to manage their affairs you know, as they would manage their affairs in any nation on earth. Oftentimes, these markets are interdicted by people that do a great deal of traveling, for example. And so this decision affects that as well. I think that moving forward from September, and we talked about October surprises earlier, it almost seems illogical to expect that an October surprise would not include some sort of financial event of some kind, whether it's a significant turndown in the Dow and the NASDAQ, whether it's a significant impact of Asian markets by, you know, elevated military activity, whether it's a significant turn down in worldwide oil and gasoline and a, and a sharp increase in fuel prices because of expanded conflict in the Middle East. You know, all of this is happening in response to events like the XRP case of nine eight of, of uh, just a few weeks ago, which we're expecting a case closed date coming up soon. Uh, or, or like the the shuttering of Edmund de Rothschild offices in Monaco and other areas across Europe, which we've also seen happening just in the last six weeks. It literally is, I think, a move and a counter move, um, you know, progression of events as we go forward. And it's very, very exciting that we're utilizing their own bureaucratic infrastructure to put the nail into their bureaucratic infrastructure. Hundred percent. And to complement what you were saying, SG, on the backs of that. You also have President Trump who said at many rallies, once I'm back, Gary Gensler is going to be fired. Now, we, if we know anything about the pedigree of these nefarious people, like many, Warren Buffett, there's too many to list. They, you know, he's been dropping, you know, Bank of America shares. I think it was like, what, three weeks ago, $981 million and on and on it goes because they know what's coming. The writing's on the wall. I would not be surprised to see that be the first major bank that goes down the down the, the drain. But uh, Gary Gensler probably is not going to be waiting for President Trump to be optically reelected before he backs out. He, I would expect that once this XRP case is uh, concluded with no appeal, that he'll probably exit stage left as well. And, and again, President Trump has kind of given us a clue that that's, there's an inev inevitability with that aspect tied to XRP and everything else conjoined. Uh, last question today, SG, I think that puts a, a nice little uh, pin in this nicely and, and let, levels it out evenly. So we've talked about it in the beginning of this podcast, and I, I said I would address it. So let's do it now. The BRICS nations, as you mentioned, uh, roughly 160 nations total and in, in either, either represented or planning to join uh, very shortly. And I think Japan, we can add to that list as well for obvious reasons. Coming up in uh, Kazan in Moscow with Putin leading at October 22nd to 24th, it seems to me, and I would love to get your take on this, obviously, it's a little too coincidental that they're having it at that, at that specific date, less than two weeks before the election, if we have one. And it would seem that that's going to be the final sort of proverbial middle finger to the U.S. petrodollar hegemony, which Saudi Arabia already obliged back in June by doing their part which we know is a pivotal player along with India that we need to watch at said event. So I guess the question is, would you agree that that times it all well for them to drop the dollar death on the deep state prior to the election and that they will make a decisive move to then nationalize all of those countries that are represented within BRICS, like Iraq, like Iran, like Vietnam, Zimbabwe, et cetera, to then power up their currencies uh, because they're not gonna be able to rely on the dollar anymore 
and, and to be able to back their countries and, and create a sense of nationalism within the process. You know, I think you're really on to something with that, John. And and honestly, I don't know what more I would add to it because I really think that the essence of this upcoming meeting and the events that are to follow are, are primarily aimed at returning national control over national resources and national markets. The Iranians want control over their economy and their markets. Again, they haven't had that for a long time in an authentic fashion. Same is true of Iraq and all of the other Middle East countries. And really, the same can be said of, of all of us in the NATO Western worlds, too, in a in a many respects, just in a different way, and maybe at a, at a higher level up the Leviathan, if you want to call it that. So moving forward, I think you've exactly, you've got exactly that infrastructure and that diplomatic cooperative template being laid out. The BRICS nations have had significant progress and, and economic summits, uh, both both marketed as BRICS events and marketed as just regional events, but have included predominantly BRICS members really over the last three years or, or last four years in a very high gear, very significant way. You know, Moscow recently personally extended the invitation. I, as a matter of fact, I think it was to Zimbabwe to come to one of the economic events that's happening in Russia upcoming. That speaks you know volumes to me because of the exact uh, reasons we were discussing earlier you know the dropping the dollar death on the planet i think is a a huge um it's going to be an enormous scare event that will reverberate generationally so it does have to be positioned delicately it does have to be positioned with finality and we have to have the trust fall uh infrastructure if we want to call it that already ready to go in the background to receive that uh, that fall down and to refire that engine. I was just talking earlier on a broadcast about refiring the economic machine in the West once it does, you know, sort of devalue itself and, and crash back to what are appropriate levels, right? Because we've seen you know, more than $750 trillion in derivatives uh, taken against, you know, our largest financial institutions. And the only reason that they've managed to maintain those levels, for example, is because of their uh, literal uh, physical manipulation in some regards, but certainly uh, financial manipulation of worldwide markets and reporting. And that itself is a whole huge podcast, but it fundamentally underpins exactly why some of this has to be the fashion that it does and how big of an event this dollar turndown is going to be and needs to be. It needs to be significant enough that it paralyzes the U.S. military machine, whatever warlords might be left over that would cause us problems in that period of time. It needs to be significant enough that a, a decent amount of confusion is present for at least 24 hours in NATO Western world countries because you're going to have bad actors that are going to meet uh, the piper, if you want to call it that, in that period of time in at least some form and fashion. It also needs to be uh, long lived enough that significant movements can occur inside of a lot of those BRICS nations that you were just talking about a moment ago. Uh, the Indian military, for example, has had contested territory on the Pakistani and Chinese borders for a very long time, and China is, is ostensibly one of their allies inside the BRICS nations. So you may see some of some amount of adjudication on the ground internally with those nations and the U.S. dollar markets completely sidelined coinciding with those events. We've, we see the obvious connection with the territories of the Pacific and the movement of the Chinese and Korean militaries with respect to the timing of a Western event, and I think we talked about that a little bit earlier. So I think these types of meetings are sort of, you know, ironing out uh, key time frames, maybe is the best way to say it, or key expectations from within these very significant pay players inside of BRICS that are expecting this event to happen to them rather than be caused by them, right? The expansion of conflict in the Middle East is likely to be, a, as you cited a moment ago, it's likely to be an overplay of that deep state component hand. It's likely to be an intelligence community or a deep state warlord military industrial community event that causes a cascade of events, a sequence of events, which you know brings the petrodollar down and really provides that kneecap blow to those North American markets. And so I think the BRICS nations are expecting these events. They're planning for these events. They know that these events are coming and they're positioning themselves to respond to these events. And I'd like to close with this particular component for the discussion. When we talk about positioning themselves, we have to remember that at least a couple of members of this BRICS alliance are playing a much broader game of military chess worldwide. And President Trump literally told us that a few days ago at the rally in Wisconsin, where he asked out loud rhetorically why Putin would vote for Kamala and then said, because he's a chess player. So understanding then that we are 
positioning ourselves in some regards, this, this alternate trading block to deal with the death of the dollar. And they're having excel increasingly uh, uh, and acceleratingly more uh, frequent meetings surrounding intercooperability, interagency cooperability, governmental cooperability, uh, you know, resource exchange, how they're going to to merge ledgers, right? We saw a, a true closed system ledger launched between Russia and Tehran just a couple of months ago. I think that's our clue for timing that they're expecting this to occur very, very soon, potentially in the next 60 days. I think you're right over the target. I, I, I'm strongly as our team strong contention SG to your point that um, that I think that that over the next six weeks, give or take, you know, we're in a seminal time frame here for a lot of financial and geopolitical events. I, I know people hear that and say, oh, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. But it's just the back wall and the noose is tightening to a degree that it, it's just unavoidable now. It can't be stretched out. We're we're at that tipping point. And and, and once, one last little uh, nuance or wrinkle to complement to your point, SG, let's remember historically that a couple months ago, China has set up shop within Zimbabwe specifically, since you mentioned them, to invest over $300 million in mining infrastructure because they know how resource rich that country is with arguably some of the world's largest gold resources, just to name a few diamonds and the agriculture is off the charts. So yeah, it's a very, very uh, compelling point that you make. Um, SG, as we close off our show, as always, uh, final thoughts that you have for our audience and where can people find you specifically? Well, I can be found in three places online. I'm on Truth, X, formerly Twitter, and Rumble. I can be found on Truth at the handle Real SGNon with a red check mark, R E A L S G N on with a red check mark. I'm on X at the handle V T H E. Q News Patriot with a blue check mark, and I'm on Rumble at the Q News Patriot as well. Rumble.com slash user slash Q News Patriot. I'm not on Rumble by SGN on. With respect to closing thoughts, John, I think the closing thoughts are that this is the breach. This is the most exciting time in this journey. We're very nearly there. The disease is very nearly under control if we want to utilize the healthcare metaphor. And so at this point, I would encourage patriots to simply take a step back and appreciate that they've survived this long, that we've taken this much ground, that we've pinned them against the wall in such a fashion that they've never been pinned before. It's one thing when you have an experienced opponent that's fought their way out of a tight spot a few times. It's another thing when you get a Goliath that has never had to contend with a, a significant or equal, equal opportunity opponent, if we want to call it that who is not able to understand how to get out of a situation where they've been pinned and, and are really you know, left with not a lot of options. And we're going to see whatever ridiculous options they might have left that are outside of the norm and which would immediately expose the entirety of the agenda. I think those are coming. We've talked about the 25th Amendment. I've said several times on air that some sort of you know, War Powers Emergency Activation under Executive Order 13224, which is still an active executive order in the Federal Register. This is, you know, these are possibilities and potentials that exist out there. But fundamentally, why, why would those things be in play at all? It's because they have no other choice. And for the first time in history, they have no other choice because we have forced their hand. Uh, this is the this is the greatest time I think to be alive, and I'm looking very much forward to the discussion to be had on the other side of a significant amount of this adjudication, because we're going to transform the landscape of NATO Western world countries into beacons of prosperity, freedom, and abundance, the likes of which have just never been seen on this planet in all of its history. Absolutely, 100%, and thank you for giving the details, SG, and on our end, just to finish up. You've heard SG kind of extol the virtues of what's going on financially, particularly with BRICS. So um, just to let those of your audience, SG and ours know as well, if you are looking to inquire about foreign currencies, bonds with Zimbabwe, any of those things where you're trying to add to the cache of position of what you've already got, we have a link in the description for that under the more section where you can investigate and get more details. SG and on, thanks for joining us, brother. As always, we appreciate your invaluable insights and input, and we look forward to seeing you again next month. God bless, John. Thanks for having me back. Be safe, sir. God bless. Take care.